everyone, and thank you for joining us for our June Bird Friendly Communities Lunch and Learn webinar. Um, we're really excited today to talk about invasive species, specifically invasive plants. Um, but before we get to that, I do want to cover just a few things. Um, there are two ways you may be joining us today, either through Zoom or through Facebook. Um, we're happy to accept any questions that you have throughout the presentation, um, and we'll answer as many of those as we can at the end. So if you're joining us on Zoom, you can submit your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And if you're joining us through Facebook, you can submit your questions to the comment section there. So I'll monitor those throughout, but again, we'll answer those at the end. Um, so thank you for joining us today. We're really excited. Um, we are recording this presentation. So if you'd like to view it again at a later time or share it with others, you can do so. Um, the recording will be available immediately after we end on our Facebook page. Um, and we'll get it uploaded to the Michigan Audubon YouTube channel um, within the next week or so. So feel free to check it out there. Um, if you are watching a recording of this video, or if you have questions at a later time, you can send those to us at the Michigan Audubon general email address at birds at michiganaudubon.org. Um, you can also find all of our past lunch and learns from the Bird Friendly Community series on the Michigan Audubon YouTube page, um, and any future videos will be uploaded there as well. So. Um, we hope you were able to enjoy those um, on your own time as well. We're really happy today to be talking about invasive species. Last month we talked about native plants, um, so this is a beautiful complement to that. Um, we're lucky to have with us um, Sal and Chihuahua. So um, I will hand things over to her at this time to talk to us about invasive species. Hey, I'll just share my screen, get us going that way. Okay, again, so my name is Fallon and I am the coordinator of the Berry Calcoon Kalamazoo Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, or BCK SISMA, because that's a lot. Um, the backgrounds of all of my slides have um, invasive species that I won't be able to cover fully in depth because there's so many invasive species, the first one being emerald ash borer. Um, I'm sure you've all seen, you might not see the bug very often, but I'm sure you've seen the effects it's done to our native ash trees. And this is autumn olive, another super common one throughout all of Michigan. So an invasive species is a two-part definition. It has to be both non-native and cause harm, either to the environment, economy, or human health. And sometimes a combination of all three of those. For example, many of our apple trees aren't native to Michigan, but we like them and enjoy eating them. They don't cause harm they are not invasive. On the other hand, poison ivy, we know that it causes harm to uh, us, but it is a native species, so it is not considered an invasive species. And then oriental bittersweet, it both causes harm to our native species and it is not from Michigan, so it's an invasive. And this is spotted lanternfly. It's not yet found in Michigan, but a good one to keep an eye out for. And then for the purpose of definitions, a weed is just a plant that somewhere you don't want it. So it really, any plant could be a weed. This is common buckthorn. So with invasives, they all have a strong human influence. So most likely they're here because we move them here either by accident or on purpose sometimes. And this is glossy buckthorn, slightly different, both invasive. So the common places you'll find invasives are in gardens and lawns because they were first planted as ornamentals. And then in trails and road right-of-ways, in constructions and in ditches, all because they were moved either on accident on our equipment or our gear. This is purple leaf stripe. And then invasives have common characteristics that allow them to outcompete our native species. They grow quickly, normally starting to grow earlier in the, in the spring and later in the fall than our natives. They tolerate a wide variety of conditions such as soil, moisture levels, and sun. They have no natural predator or competitor like they would in their native environment. They reproduce prolifically either by having a massive seed source or being able to spread effectively and frequently. 
This is the Asian longhorn beetle of the male and female. This is a list of invasive species that are super common in Michigan. Um, I'm in the southern lower area, so a little bit more lean towards that, but you can find most of these all over Michigan. And these are emerging threats in Michigan. Some are found in very low concentrations and some are not found yet. So definitely ones to keep an eye out for. This is hemlock woolly adelgid. So the adelgid itself is super tiny and you wouldn't be able to, normally can't see it with a naked eye. However, it leaves these white cottony looking masses that you can see. The Nature Conservancy estimated that worldwide there's 1.4 trillion spent from on damage from invasive species. And this is a few years old, this statistic is a few years old, so that number only continues to grow because invasive species just continue to harm. Now I'll start going to more in depth on the invasive species that I'll cover. So this is giant hogweed. It is from the Central Asia area. It was first brought over in the 1800s as an ornamental in an arboretum. In the arboretum, they figured it would be more contained. However, it did escape. It's called giant hogweed for a reason. It can reach heights of 15 feet tall. It has compound lobe leaves that alternate on the stem. It also has compound umbels for its flowers. So a group of flowers come together to make a massive group of flowers, this whole flower head. It has coarse hairs and purple blotches on its stem. So you see these coarse hairs and then the blotches come, become more prevalent towards the base of the stem. Giant hogweed does have a photo dermatitis quality to it. So if you touch the oils to your skin, within 48 hours, it can cause a severe burn. Um, and then also if you get those oils in your eye, you could have potential um, temporary or permanent blindness. Some lookalike species for giant hogweed, the first one being cow's parsnip. This one only reaches heights about seven feet tall. The flowers have more of a flat top instead of more of an umbrella shape with their compound umbels. The hairs on the stems are not, are like softer, not so stiff, and it's lacking the purple blotches on the stem. The next is Angelica. These can reach um, heights of about nine feet tall. The stems are entirely purple. The flower heads are more spherical in their shape, so little, little balls all together instead of coming, merging all together. And then the leaves are more like a normal compound leaf. They don't fuse together. Another look like oh, is poison hemlock. Again, this one reaches about nine feet tall. The stems do have the purple blotches, but they do not have the hairs and those thicker nodes. Um, the flowers are smaller, much smaller. They don't form as big of a head. And then the leaves look more like ferns or parsley. The research isn't quite as conclusive with giant hogweed. Um, normally when you see it in the state, you only see one or two plants by itself. You don't see it like a massive field of giant hogweed, which is great. Um, but this, so the strategies are kind of hit or miss. Um, we do know not to mow it because um, that stimulates budding from the rootstocks. But we've had good success if you dig out the entire plant, including all of the roots, or if you foliar or spray it. Um, removing the seed heads does prevent spread, but you would continue to see the plant grow year after year. Again, with all of this, wear proper PPE because of those ferns. The next invasive I'm going to talk about is mile a minute weed. This is native to East Asia. It's been in the United States since the 1800s, 
but in Michigan, it was first found this October 2020 in the Albion area, which is my BC case is my area, and it's a twine vine. It has really triangular shaped leaves that are a slightly lighter color, so it's easier to pick out when you're looking at a group of plants. And those leaves alternate on the vine. They have these recurved barbs for climbing up along the entire stem. They have small green flowers. And then another super noticeable characteristic is that their berries are covered with a blue tepal. Mile a minute weed is called that because it can grow up to six inches in one day. The seeds can float for about nine days and also wildlife likes to move, eat and move these seeds too. So it's very easily spread from one area to another and it just chokes out everything that it grows on top of. It does stay like this was a picture of November, in November after the, it had died off for the season, but it does stay this light tan color. So even in the winter, you might be able to identify it. Some lookalike species for mile minute weed is tear thumb. Tear thumb's in the same family as mile minute weed. Um, it does have these recurved barbs along the stem, but the leaf shapes are different and the seeds would not have those blue coverings or the berries, excuse me. Another lookalike is false buckweed for mile minute weed. These leaves can look, especially when they're small, look like those triangular leaves, but the backs of them curve downwards. Also, the stems don't have those recurved barbs. Again, the berries would not have those blue coverings. Mile a minute weed can be hand pulled or mowed if you get it before those seeds enter the seed bank. Um, so the pulling would stop growing, but if the seeds had fallen, it would just come back again. Um, there are some foliar applications and there is a weevil. We are still working on the best management practices of mission because we just found it. Um, but it's been in New York, so we're looking at, we're looking towards them to find the best management practices for our locations. The next is Chinesium. This is native to China. Um, it was brought over in the 1800s and again is a vine. The leaves are fiddle shaped and are grow directly across from each other on the vine. They have parallel veins, meaning they start and they go, so they go down the leaf instead of having a midpoint that they all kind of parallel from, I mean, all grow, branch out from. It's hard to find a good picture of the flowers. Um, in person, I haven't seen the flowers either, but they are very small, bell-shaped, inconspicuous flowers with Chinese yam. They have large tuberous roots, which make them so hard to kill off. Um, these roots are also edible. If you Google Chinese yam and you don't put something about invasive, you will just see a bunch of recipes for eating the roots. They also have these air bulbs or um, sometimes known as air potatoes that they're seed. Um, these are not the seeds. But when dropped, they act like a, a plant, like a new root system. This is from a site um, in my local area of Barry County. This is the same site. You can see it growing up a tree. And then this other side is a ladder connected to the house. So it just covers everything it can grow on. There's a ton of lookalikes for Chinese yam. So we'll go quickly through these. Um, the first is wild yam, the same parallel vein pattern, but these are more heart-shaped leaves. Green burrs, um, again with the parallel veins, but the leaves are more oval to shallow heart, and the flowers are umbels and will no air potatoes present. Again with the um, Wild yam doesn't have air potatoes either. Wild potato, 
is or native morning glories have the heart shape to arrow shaped leaves. Um, but the veins are from a central mid vein. So this middle part. Um, the flowers are large and showy and no air potatoes. The next is bind, hedge bindweed. They have a similar shaped leaves, but the veins are from a central midpoint. The flowers are large and showy. And then again, no air potatoes. The last one, false buckwheat, which is also another look alike to Mila Minuteweed, if you remember. The leaves are the arrow shaped. The veins are from a central mid vein instead of being parallel. The fruits are small, but again, no air potatoes. Cutting and mowing Chinese yam will control the spread because you're not allowing those air potatoes or seeds to grow. But they will, because that the massive root system, they will continue to grow. So you're just stopping it from going to the neighbors, not your own house. Until those roots are exhausted, which would take a very long time. Other management includes chemical foliar spray. This is swallowwort. There are two kinds, black and pale. The black is this purple color flower. The pale is this pink color flower. And that's the only, the meth's main difference you'll see. The black is from the Mediterranean area, the Ukraine, um, the pale is from the uh, Ukraine area and brought over in the 1800s. Swallowwort is a vine. The leaves are directly across from each other on the stem. They have pointed tips and a smooth waxy coating. Both black and pale have a heart-shaped flower. If you look super closely at the flowers, the black has like a wider um, star shape and the um, pale is a little bit skinnier in the flower and the flowers petals. Swallowwort has seed pods that disperse that are wind dispersed, kind of like a milkweed seed pod. Um, swallowwort is a monarch sink. So we don't know how often monarchs lay their eggs on swallowwort, but when they do, when the caterpillar catches and comes out and eats swallowwort, it will die. It's um, the roots are also harmful to livestock. And then like many other invasive species, it becomes a monoculture and chokes out all the plants around it. This is swallowwort growing in a forest, covering all the trees. These are just a close up of how many seed pods can grow on one small area of swallowwort. Some lookalikes are milkweed. So a, a lot of the milkweed characteristics are pretty different, but because of that connection to the monarchs, um, people connect the two. But the flowers are in those umbels, not star-shaped. The milkweed seed pods are much fatter and have those little pricklies on them. Another is dogbane. These don't have as waxy of a coating. The flowers are bell-shaped. The seed pods do look a little bit similar, um, but those, their seed pods are long and skinny, well, a little bit longer and skinnier. Management for swallowwort. Digging can be effective if you get the entire root system. If you don't get all of it, that will stimulate growth, which is why cutting and mowing is not a great idea for swallowwort. Other removal does include a foliar spray. Oh, and if you take off the seed pods for swallowwort, again, you'd be preventing spread, but you would not kill that off that infestation. Next is Phragmites, also called common reed. It is native to Europe. It was first seen in the East Coast in the 1700s. It is a restricted species for Michigan, and that means you it is illegal to move, buy, or sell this plant. It has a dense, fluffy seed head that are purple in the spring. And then the seed heads turn the straw color, 
followed by the stems becoming a straw color and those stems remain standing throughout the winter. Um, in some parts of Michigan where it's most dense, like the Saginaw Bay area, they can reach heights of over 15 feet tall. I think even this picture looks over 15 feet to me. If you pull back the leaf, they have their hairs on the ligules. Phragmites spreads via horizontal rhizomes, so they are connected by one root. They are also spread by seed. At first, we thought the seeds were not viable. Um, now, the th the last I've heard is the seeds are about thirty percent viable. Um, 30 doesn't sound like a lot, but there are over 2,000 seeds on one seed head, so that adds up pretty quickly. There is a study with Grand Valley showing that Phragmites decreases property values. It blocks views, water recreation, sites of road intersections. Um, Phragmites also crowds out all the native plants. And in the winter, the dead material can be high heat intensive burns, which would be problematic if accidentally caught on fire. This is Phragmites right next to a cornfield in a road right of way situation. This is supposed to be a view out to a water body. This can be hard to see, but right here is somebody's feet on a boardwalk. This is that same boardwalk um, pre and post to, so this bottom picture is after two years of management. And the management did include biomass removal. Otherwise you would still see the dead remaining stalks there. There is a native Phragmites. It has a red stem at the bottom. That is not present in invasive, not as present. Um, this is a native stand. You can see the heads are not quite as dense um, and they don't grow quite as tall. It almost looks like a sick version of invasive Phragmites. Um, the fear is with these two though, that they might hy they're, they're hybridizing and creating another form of ones that would be invasive. A lookalike is reed canary grass. This one gets nowhere near as tall as Phragmites. Um, however, it's also invasive. So in the spring, if you can't tell them apart, they're both bad. In the spring though, to tell them apart, you can pull back the leaf and in reed canary grass, you'll see this plastic looking sheath thing. And in Phragmites, you saw those hairs. There is a ton of management efforts with Phragmites cutting, mowing, burning without a, before a chemical spray does nothing. It's a grass, it kind of likes those efforts, but there are efforts to cut, mow, burn after foliar spray. What you use depends totally on the situation and where it's located. The last one I'll go into depth with is Japanese knotweed. It is from Japan, was brought over in the 1800s as an ornamental. Some people still like how thick and dense it grows. So it's almost like a natural fence line. However, it is prohibited in Michigan, so illegal to buy, sell, move. The stem, I mean, the leaves alternate on the stem causing this zigzag pattern. They have these, the stems are hollow and have these thick nodes kind of resembling a bamboo. A lot of people do call this Michigan bamboo. The leaves are flat at the base and the flowers are white spikes. It is the first to come up after a volcano, so it has no problem growing through concrete or road right of and also housing foundations. These are pictures of it growing in Michigan houses. In the UK, they have such a major problem with that that a lot of people cannot sell their house if Japanese knotweed is on the property. This shows what it looks like if you mow Japanese knotweed. So in the back along that farm is a large stand of Japanese knotweed that must have been hit by the mower because you now see it 
if you look closely, all throughout this grass, little pieces of it regrowing. And eventually this whole yard is just gonna be a massive stand of Japanese knotweed, if nothing's done. Same with road right-of-ways. If you get a little piece, it tends to go, you'll see it down the whole right-of-way of that road and generally into the next road. You only need the piece the size of your fingernail for to regrow, which is why mowing is so bad. Same with a river system. So this is little pieces break off from the river itself and then just float down and continue to spread down the river. I think this picture is interesting because it's Phragmites and Japanese knotweed growing right next to each other. So if I could go back to that side, it'd be very cool to see which, which one is more prevalent or stronger, or would they just stay like that stagnant, fighting against each other the whole time. There are different forms of knotweed. So the most common, you just call it um, Japanese. However, they're all invasive. So there's no true need to tell them apart. But if you're curious, there is giant knotweed. The leaves are bigger than regular knotweed. They have a heart shape to the base instead of that flat spade shape. They also have a stiff, a stiff hair on the underside. Bohemian knotweed is a hybrid between giant and Japanese. So in the same plant, you'll see both a spade shaped flat base and you'll also see the heart base. With this one, it does have a hair, it's like giant, but they're a little bit softer. Another one that isn't in Michigan, but also a knotweed is Himalayan knotweed. These have a more spade shaped leaf and a pinker flower. Um, and these are those identification, identification keys all right next to each other. As you'll see down here, the um, giant is easier um, to reproduce than Japanese. So that would make it a bigger target to get rid of first or Japanese knotweed, so then it doesn't hybridize and spread as much. A lookalike that isn't one of the knotweeds is called pokeweed. It has these lance-shaped leaves. The stems are entirely purple and does not have those nodes, making it less bamboo looking, and also has these blackberry. So how do you treat Japanese knotweed? Do you cut it? No, that causes spread. Do you mow it? Also causes it to spread. Do you burn it? You would see top die off, but it would just keep growing back. Do you dig it up? No, it has such a massive root system, it would almost be impossible to get every piece of it out. Glyphosate? Not necessarily. A lot of times you'll see top die off with glyphosate, but then it would just keep growing like right from the patch, right next to the patch or even nothing at all. Do you ignore it? No, it would just keep growing that root system. And so there are best management practices that you can follow. There's a, a lot of different type of herbicide sprays besides glyphosate that you can use. Um, it all depends on the site, like close to water or not and how massive the infestation is itself. Now we're back to the short, quick slides of invasives. So this is spotted knapweed. So if you're not in the BCK, BCK Sisma area, you can still contact a Sisma. There's Sisma. Every county in Michigan is covered by a Sisma. Um, if you can go to michiganinvasives.org or you can contact me and I can get you in contact with the person, either works. So the easiest and cheapest way to, um, to deal with invasive species is to never have them in the first place. So that's why you see down here is prevention. And then when it's new to the area, you have a rapid response. After that, when it's super common, 
is management and control. This is multiflora rose. And so some prevention techniques include buying fireware, firewood where you plan to burn it. This prevents live insects from being transported via the cut wood. When planting, choose native. There have been many cases where invasive species were recommended. And a big example of that would be Audamala, which we later learned was not great to be recommended everywhere. Decontaminate gear and equipment be um, between sites. Don't release unwanted plants and animals into the wild, like your goldfish. And educate on invasive species so people know what they have. This is European frogbit. This is an aquarium species that was dumped and now um, we're found in Michigan, quite prevalent. So if for early detection, rapid response, if you see something, every, almost every SISMA is able to come out and help you identify that and talk you through best management practices. Some have um, strike teams or cost share systems be able to treat some of their priority species for you. Um, some do not, just depends on the SISMA. This is Japanese barberry. This is a good example of an ornamental that is still sold and planted today. For those really common invasive species that are already everywhere, it'd be best to talk to your SISMA again for best management practices. They can always give you recommendations, possibly treat for you depending on the species and the location if it's a high priority area for that species. And a lot of, help, and a lot of them help with volunteer work days. So they can help a group remove from like a trail system. This is garlic mustard. And since I flew through the best management practices of a lot of the other species, some options for things like garlic mustard, dame's rocket, or woody species before they're really large is hand pulling. Some woody invasive is cut as they're larger is cut stump so you cut off at the base and dab the stump with a herbicide most all invasives can be foliar sprayed and in very rare cases you can dig up an invasive species to get rid of it always making sure you remove the entire root mass oh yellow floating heart thank you and now i can take any questions if you have them and my information. So if you have questions afterwards, feel free to reach out to me. Fantastic, thanks, Alan. So again, if you do have questions, you can submit those to us. Um, I just wanna get started by, I know you kind of touched on this, but if people have invasive species or species that they think are invasive species in their yard, what is their first step? What should they do? Um, so they can go to michiganinvasivespecies.org and find their SISMA. Another great app is the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network, or MISIN. If you type in misin.msu.edu, that's a self-citizen science reporting system that they could report that way too. Um, some SISMAs look at that, some don't. So if you really wanted the best management practices, you're gonna need to contact the SISMA. But if you just wanna report that it's there, MISIN's great. Also, MISIN has a bunch of educational tools that you can look up. Is this really what I'm seeing? Perfect. So that's a really great place for people to get started. Um, I did also want to just um, put in a quick plug while I'm thinking about it, because you did talk about um, kind of work days that some of these SISMAs do, but Michigan Audubon also has work days um, at our sanctuary to take care of some of our invasive species. So autumn olive is a huge problem at a lot of our species, because as you mentioned, it was actually recommended by a lot of organizations for the birds because they have these great berries. But we now know that those berries are not as nutritious for our birds as native plants and they also spread like crazy and so we're trying to get rid of that along with that garlic mustard and dames rocket and multi-floor rose and all those wonderful species you talked about so if anyone is interested in helping um, with some of that invasive species removal and learn a little bit more about those invasive species um, you can check out michigan audubon's website michiganaudubon.org for any of those scheduled work days 
um, if you are interested in helping at other sanctuaries where work days aren't scheduled. Um, you can also find information there on how to contact us and we might be able to put you um, to work on other pieces of property as well. Um, so again, questions, please send them to us if you have them. Um, one more for you here, Fallon. Um, in terms of these invasive species, you mentioned in a lot of those, um, a lot of ones you talked about that they were here a long time ago. They've been here a long time and some of them are just kind of moving to Michigan. But why, why is it that they've been around for this long and we're just now kind of starting to see them and starting to get rid of them here in Michigan? Um, really good question. I, probably some of them are all different. So like, I'm going to answer and it might not be correct for every single invasive. Um, but I think also we're moving things more um, and not and doing them very quickly, like construction is done really quickly and we aren't cleaning the equipment. Um, we're hiking everywhere to travel to a hike place is super common. Um, and so if it was down south and then you went to hike up here, you possibly could still be moving stuff. Um, so just how much we're moving, I think, is how it's spreading a little bit quicker. Also, I think we're trying to be a little bit more aware of invasive species and knowing what they are. Um, so Japanese knotweed has probably always been a problem when it's growing right next to their house. Um, but now we just have more sismas and knowledge about not only is it a problem just for my house, but it's a problem for the environment. Great. So Hopefully that answered a little bit. Yeah. No, so again, we can do a lot to help prevent that. I mean, that's the moral of the story here, right? Uh, so um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. We'll give you guys another minute because I've got one more for you. Um, in your opinion, what is the what is the single greatest invasive species threat to our state at this point in time? Oh, that's so hard because everyone would have a different opinion. I think um, for somebody who doesn't care about invasives and in like an environmental standpoint, I guess not. We just scary to everyone because of that housing problem. Um, I'm super scared of mile a minute weed because it just got to my to the area. Some great farmers would be really scared of the spotted lantern fly. It all depends on where your interests lie, I guess, of what invasive you are most afraid of. That's a really good point. It's definitely something to consider. We all have our own stake in things. And so all of these things impact us a little bit differently. Um, but there, there are things we can do about it. And so I think that's the great part. Um, there are actually action items that you all can take away from this presentation. There are things that you can do, ways that you can report these um, species, manage them, you know, take care of, make sure that you're cleaning your equipment as you move from space to space. All of those things are great things that we can all do. So um, I don't see any other questions. I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you again to Fallon for joining us. Um, I hope you guys were all able to learn something new. Um, I'm sure you were. There's a lot of great information here. Again, this is recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again, you can find it um, on, our, or on our Facebook page right away and on our YouTube channel um, within the next week. So next month, we will be doing another Bird Friendly Communities overview. So we'll talk about the program as a whole and all of the different actions and things that you can do to help make your community more bird friendly. So um, I hope you're able to join us for future programs as well. Um, but again, if you miss them, you can always watch the recording. So thanks once again and enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone.